Uh, our next speaker is Leonard Petroselli from the um, Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, where he is professor of neuroscience. Uh, Leonard has been a, um, a previous uh, grantee, and um, he has been working since, since I first kind of got involved in the area of uh, protein aggregation from the clinical end. Um, he's been one of the, uh, the people whose papers I've used to, uh, to teach, to learn about, uh, about this field, um, starting back in, uh, back in the 90s. Uh, his, uh, his work has been on, um, mostly on the chaperone network and stress signaling. Uh, recently, he's worked on uh, TDP43 models and on um, the role of progranulin in FTD. And the topic of his uh, project that he will be presenting today is chip-mediated regulation of the HSP90 high affinity complex. Dr. Petroselli. Thank you, Larry, for uh, a very kind introduction as well as uh, the, the opportunity to present, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, my work and uh, as well as uh, to um, um, uh, Adrian for uh, really organizing um, um, the event. So as Larry uh, pointed out, I mean, most of my work has been focusing on uh, chaperones and uh, it started uh, actually when I was in um, Mike Hutton's uh, group at, at Mayo Clinic and so putting uh, together these slides uh, was a, a bit of a flashback of uh, my uh, research um, fellow days and so um, it's going to be a somewhat of a historical uh, perspective uh, since Michelle did a wonderful job in terms of the, the tau background, um, what I'm going to basically do is, you know, from start to finish, as far as you know, how I basically got interested in chaperones, um, and then also the therapeutic implications. I think of our work as we actually have recently identified uh, one, and now actually a more recent, um, a second potential target uh, for tauopathies, and actually that that will be uh, HDAC6. And so uh, Michelle, you know, briefly touched upon uh, some of the points. Um, this is a schematic. You know, that somewhat uh, identifies perhaps the current uh, approaches um, to uh, treat uh, tauopathies, uh, including microtubule stabilizers, uh, potential kinase inhibitors or phosphatase in, um, inhibitors where you can regulate uh, the, the, phos the phosphorylation event. Tau reducers, we heard just a, a touch upon, you know, passive immunization um, to uh, alleviate and perhaps uh, remove um, the tau burden within, um, within individuals and has been shown quite compellingly in, in animal models. Um, HSP90 inhibitors, which regulates the chaperone uh, response, how that might be involved to facilitate uh, tau degradation. And so my work, um, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, how we got involved in therapeutically, um, how HSP90 inhibitors may um, hold some promise, but also more recently with um, the advent of um, acetylation being another post translation modification that's been known to exist with, with tau. Work from uh, Lee Gann out of Gladstone and uh, yet again Virginia Lee and her group showing that acetylation might actually have uh, an important role in how tau functions as well as its um, aggregation properties. And so that's what I'm going to share uh, today. So um, I became quite interested in the ubiquitin proteasome system. And so this is a simply a, a diagram that basically shows that there's in numerous events, numerous enzymatic processes that, it, that in, encounter, starting with an E1 activating enzyme in concert, uh, which transfers the free ubiquitin to the E2, and with E3, the ubiquitin ligase, such as CHIP, uh, can ultimately lead to the polyubiquitination of a protein substrate. When that occurs, it can be degraded by the 26S uh, proteasome. But not all substrates which are ubiquitinated uh, end up to be degraded, depending upon uh, the type of linkage that occurs, as well as the number of ubiquitin um, that's covalently attached. And the recycle can um, you know, repeat itself. So that's where my career somewhat uh, kicked off, and I became really fascinated with uh, the chip protein. And one of the first things that I did in Mike um, Hutton's group was actually make a chip antibody. So we did the 30,000 foot uh, somewhat experiment and just wanted to see whether or not uh, there was any ch chip immunoreactivity in a variety of tauopathies. And so this is just a representative slide of what you actually find in Alzheimer's disease and pigs' brains where chip, you know, very markedly, uh, you know, shows very enhanced uh, uh, chip immunoreactivity, seeing numerous um, tau um, inclusions and NFTs, also in pigs. And you do find it, but to a lesser extent, in PSP as well as um, in CBD as well. But not, not 
to the extent of what you find in AD as well as in Pick's disease. So the first thing that um, I wanted to assess was well whether or not these two proteins actually interact. And so what we made was a series of chip deletion constructs. Uh, it, it contains two um, very important domains, this uh, tetracopeptide repeat domain, which basically serves as the interface between HSP70 and 90 and quite important. And the absence of that or mutations in it can, can, can completely abrogate the ability to bind to those chaperones, which are very important for substrate recognition as well as degradation. It also contains the U-box domain, which is a uh, very important imperative for its uh, ubiquitin ligase activity. So we made two simple constructs as well as deletion constructs for the tau protein and fundamentally show that for the tau protein, it really needs an intact uh, full length chip molecule in order to bind. Neither one of the, the, the chip constructs, um, deletion constructs showed binding. Conversely, when we did the, the reverse experiment wanting to assess where does chip preferentially bind to the tau molecule, what you can see is that it clearly binds to the full length uh, protein um, unable to bind to the end terminal, so it was really preferring that microtubule binding domain. And this was really quite important because it really now focused in, as you will see throughout my talk, that, that the microtubule binding domain, as we well know, is very important. But even for uh, substrate um, uh, interactions and how its ability to recognize it and perturbations within this area really has profound effects on, on its degradation. And that's shown quite um, uh, simply here. And so what we wanted to assess, uh, this is a, an in vivo, what we call a ubiquitination assay, in which you uh, transfect cells with a chip and tau, and then uh, immunoblot with um, a ubiquitin antibody, in this case here an HA ubiquitin, since we transfected ubiquitin. And you can see that cells transfected with um, chip, there's a robust increased uh, ubiquitin immune reactivity, suggesting that chip is in fact ubiquitinating the tau protein. But what we saw, that, um, um, in cells transfected with PAR1 or MARC2, the, the, the human um, ortholog, which phosphorylates tau at the 12E8 site within the microtubule binding, is that it completely blocks its ability to uh, bind, as well as, as a result, it, it can't get ubiquitinated. So that really told us something that was quite important, unlike maybe perhaps other phosphorylation, such as mediated through GSK3 beta or CDK5. So if you phosphorylate that protein or even you know, modify it using uh, missense mutations and changing it um, and can't get uh, false related, that the steric conformation of that area is really, really quite important. I'm going to come back to this yet again in my talk. So Chad Dickey um, really then uh, took um, the project and uh, most of the work now uh, w was uh, uh, done by him and, and we're going to hear his work later on right after mine. And so what we did was a, a thorough analysis of chip knockout mice, uh, presumably in these animals which will lack the, 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 the enzyme, uh, do you see elevated levels of the substrate? And in short, that's in fact what we find, is that if you look at the chip knockout mice, significant levels of the variety of phospho-related um, tau antibodies were no changes in synuclein or MAP2. Um, these are just control experiments showing that if you immunoprecipitate the tau protein, um, that there is no ubiquitin um, nation to occur, suggesting that tau can accumulate, but it's actually ubiquitinated material nor is it dependent on the fact that there's any transcriptional um, influences as the quantitative RT-PCR uh, really showed no changes in the tau protein. We then wanted to assess, um, moving on to, to HSP90, um, which we know um, was able to uh, stimulate um, a heat shock response and promote tau, de uh, promote tau degradation. As shown here, this is an EC102 HSP90 inhibitor and um, cells uh, treated with that show significant decreases in, in the tau protein, as I'll come to it. But it leads to a very prominent um, increase in um, HSP70. So we, w the next series of experiments, what we wanted to assess was, if you add HSP90 inhibitors, which promotes tau degradation, is it dependent upon H HSF1, which is the heat shock factor that really stimulates everything, or is it going to be dependent upon other chaperones? And so what Chad did um, in this experiment, is, as, I sh as I just simply said, is that when we treat it with HSP90 inhibitor, there's significant reductions in phospho uh, tau, in this case here PHF1. When you use SI siRNA um, for HSF1, which now the cells cannot stimulate the heat shock response, um, it had um, no effect. Whereas knocking down 90 not only promoted tau accumulation, but also um, there was uh, it lost its ability for EC102 mediated degradation, suggesting that 
it's not part of the, it's being primarily mediated by the constitutive, but not the inducible uh, response. And I think that's shown here a little bit more clearly is what uh, we did next was simply look at all the degradation machinery that was relevant for tau, including chip, 40, 70, and hop. And what you can see is that it completely blocks EC102's ability to promote tau degradation when you knock down and reduce the levels of the respective degradation machinery. However, when you knock down using siRNA for P23 and PIN1 components of the refolding uh, pathway, um, it actually accelerated degradation um, even under controlled conditions in the absence of a drug. So what that said to us was that, that it's very a very dynamic process and we put together a potential um, mechanism that's obviously very elaborate and we still need to know a lot, a lot more that's going on. But what we feel is that like it's a dynamic uh, state that the regulation of the refolding machinery as well as the degradation machinery, if it's in balance, one or other could be potentially referred, uh, preferred. So if you knock down the refolding machinery such as P23 and PIN1, you might be favoring degradation pathway. Conversely, if you, if you knock down the, the, the degradation machinery, you might be preferring um, the refolding pathway. So <clears throat> we looked at uh, H-tau mice, uh, which are mice that was developed by Peter uh, Davies and, and Karen Duff, and they're, they're back transgenics on a tau knockout background, and used AEC-102 um, which is a blood brain permeable uh, compound, which potently increases the levels of HSP70 to see whether or not there was any effect in vivo. And in fact, that's what we observed um, is that uh, with a, a very uh, 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 short acute uh, trial, um, seven days, that there was a profound um, elevation in 70 with a concomitant decreases in the respective uh, P-tau um, levels. So th the next experiment um, that we uh, did to conduct uh, was um, really based on an experiment that was done in cancer biology. And what they found was that HSP90 inhibitors in cancer cells um, has a higher affinity of these inhibitors to bind to HSP90. And um, the reason is really unknown, but perhaps maybe it's the pathologic load inside cancer cells that maybe adopts HSP90 itself to adopt a specific conformation whereby the inhibitor now binds at a much lower affinity. So we asked the question is, well, does this exist in AD? Is the 90 that's present in, in Alzheimer's disease brain adopting a very specific conformation for the inhibitor? And that's what this basically describes. So we took AD cortex, AD cerebellum as a, as a non-disease you know, region that is uh, spared, control cortex from the respective regions, and we did the similar binding assays. And that's what that this, this shows, that there was a, a significant, almost a thousand-fold difference between AD from a cortex for the ability of EC102 this uh, inhibitor to bind in those regions compared to um, AD uh, cerebellum as well as the non-disease controls. So that you know, uh, prompted us and, and gave us promise that you know, in terms of a therapeutic window, is there um, regions as you treat uh, individuals uh, uh, to the point when, when a good candidate is, uh, will be found, hopefully, um, that you can treat at a lower dose, not affect other brain regions uh, such as the cerebellum and, and, and other, uh, well, in this case here, let's say healthy individuals, that a lower dose will be targeting those pathologic uh, cells and basically not um, having any effect on client degradation. So now this is where the, the story uh, continues to get uh, more interesting and in, in how we stumbled across uh, HDAC6. And so HDAC6 is a histone deacetylase. Um, and the reason why we, we became interested in this um, enzyme was the fact that, once again, cancer literature suggested that um, the acetylation or deacetylation of 90 um, can dr dramatically influence um, 90's um, um, binding, and as a result, it can actually enhance its affinity. I think that can be shown here. So this is work from our, um, our lab, and when you treat with an HSP90 inhibitor, one of the, the phenotypes or, or uh, excuse me, a pharmacodynamic readout that you can look at is the ability for um, the HSP90 to elevate HSP70 levels, and that's what you can see here. But when you co-treat with a HDAC6 inhibitor, um, you now see a potent uh, shift in the ability now, even at um, lo even lower conditions, but even at point one, that the curve is now shifting. So as a result of the HDAC6 uh, deacetylation activity, in this case here, you actually are increasing the acetylation of HSP90, it's actually making the, the HSP90 inhibitor bind to, to 90 at, at a much greater affinity. So 
<clears throat> what happens in terms of tau degradation. So what we did here was we uh, knocked down cells with control siRNA or HDAC6 uh, RNA uh, in the presence of transfected uh, tau and then did a, a co, um, uh, or excuse me, did a treatment with HSP9 inhibitors at various doses. And what you can see here is that cells that in the presence of the HDAC6 knockdown and drug, that there was actually a, a greater enhancement of tau degradation uh, compared to just HSP9 inhibitors alone. So um, while that's incredibly interesting, um, is there something more involved, meaning that is HDAC6 directly acting on tau itself? And so um, what we did was, uh, based on our previous experiment, we simply just overexpressed HDAC6 and, and wanted to assess whether or not there's any uh, changes in, in phosphorylate, excuse me, in, in tau levels. And, and as you can, I think, appreciate here is that when you co-transfect cells with either GFP or, or HDAC6, as there's a profound, very consistent uh, reproducible result that it significantly increases the levels of phosphotau as well as total tau levels and once again cells transfected with HDAC6. As a control we used a, um, an HDAC6, uh, an active uh, mutant which um, has, is obviously expressed but has no activity and um, obviously does not have uh, any um, uh, activity and as a result no uh, levels of uh, increased HDAC6, excuse me, increased uh, phosphotau. So, the, the story even gets better and more exciting, and a lot of the work that I'm showing now is actually unpublished. And so Lee Gan, as I mentioned uh, earlier, as well as Virginia Lee, they identified through mass spec uh, approaches that, um, you know, that there's a KXGS motif, and those are the motifs that 12E8 phosphorylates. It's within the microtubule binding domains. And uh, what they actually pulled out is that uh, these lysine residues at 259, in fact, can be acetylated um, by P300. So we then speculated, well, is there a relationship now? Um, once again, we knew that the site was quite important between the phosphorylation event of, of Mark II, which phosphorylates um, the serine residue at 262, which can be detected by the 12E8 antibody, and then as a result of HDAC6, this acetylation event, that is there something that uh, coexists between the two sites? And this experiment is just really breathtaking. So in these cells here, you, we overexpressed um, four repeat uh, tau as well as um, uh, a K259 a mutant which actually mimics um, acetylation. And what you can see here is that in cells transfected with HDAC6 alone, that there's <clears throat> excuse me, a significant uh, increase in the levels of phosphorylated tau at PHF1. When you overexpress Mark II, as anticipated, and as I showed before, there's significant increases in 12E8. But now when you co-express HDAC6 and the Mark II, the levels of 12E8 specifically, unlike PHF1 and as well as, as well as other phosphorylated epitopes, is significantly affected. And it's completely lost with a mimic of, acet um, of a, an acetylated uh, tau um, mutant, suggesting that when tau is being acetylated at this site, it now prevents the ability of 12E8 to be phosphorylated. <clears throat> so, we pursued this now and we, and we um, wanted to, to make a, a novel antibody that can detect acetylated tau at the specific uh, KXGS motifs. And this is just a control experiment where we're um, using P300 acetylation reactions, as you can see here. Um, when we overexpress, uh, this is recombinant uh, tau in vitro, um, that our antibody uh, specifically detects um, acetylated tau at these regions and not with the, the double mutant. Uh, which is completely uh, negative. Moreover, when you <clears throat> take the recombinant protein now and add cell lysates that have been treated with an HDAC6 inhibitor, um, 738 or uh, TSA, which are actually very, uh, uh, well, 738 is very selective. TSA is more a pan um, inhibitor, but also targets HDAC6. What you can see is that the, the inhibitors dramatically increase the acetylation specific, well not specifically, but at these KXGS uh, motifs, which can be detected with our antibody. And these are just the controls with a, a total um, acyl, um, acetylysine um, antibody. So <clears throat> we then uh, took primary neuronal cultures and treated with uh, uh, an HDAC6 inhibitor to see whether or not there was any changes. And even we've done these experiments now, even at lower uh, doses than one micromolar, you can see that there's a profound effect 
on the variety of, of phospho tau species. A lesser extent uh, for 12E8, but the, the levels of 12E8 in primary neuronal cultures are actually uh, quite low. But nonetheless, um, there's a significant dose-dependent decreases in PHF1, 12E8, um, and, and tau5. And as to be expected, the levels of acetylated tubulin as a control go up. So why is this important? So now am I showing you, hopefully, that you can appreciate that there's a very a dynamic relationship between acetylation and phosphorylation at the KXGS uh, motif, but are there any effects on, <clears throat> on tau aggregation? And so once again, we, uh, we make recombinant tau, and um, similar to what uh, Godart uh, you know, showed, is that it can form filaments as, as to be expected um, in tau only. However, when you acetylate uh, the tau, it completely uh, prevents the ability for tau to be aggregate. Um, we also did a, a control experiment, which we're adding tau plus P300, but it's been heat deactivated. And so you can see that, um, that it has you know, obviously no impact um, on its ability to impair the aggregation or filament assembly uh, for tau. So we're extremely um, um, optimistic about this approach. We feel that maybe perhaps unlike HSP90 inhibitors, that the HDAC6 inhibitors are actually very specific you know, for, for tau and that they're targeting uh, tau and is being recognized as, as a specific substrate, very similar to um, acetylated tubulin. So <clears throat> in summary, hopefully what you can you know, take home um, and the first part of my talk is that there's a very dynamic process between the de degradation machinery and the refolding machinery, um, and that chip is you know, clearly involved in this process. And depending upon how the system is manipulated um, in disease versus um, uh, unpathologic or non-pathologic conditions, um, may have uh, you know, profound effects on Tal's ability to be um, degraded, and as well as its function, which I didn't talk too much about in this talk. Um, it appears that the affinity for HSP90 is, is it adopting a high conformational state in Alzheimer's disease brain. And whether or not this you know, proves to be um, a therapeutic approach once um, HSP90 inhibitors um, are identified for preclinical evaluation, which is uh, still ongoing in my laboratory, and whether they have any promise for uh, clinical uh, use um, is, is an area under intense investigation and is, is really unknown. And then lastly, the two points of HDAC6, how um, I hopefully I can convince you that it's, it's having a very specific effect on tau degradation and aggregation, and we believe that this KXGS motif is really quite important. Um, and that treatment with cells uh, with the HDAC6 inhibitor reduces um, abnormal tau in primary neuronal culture. Um, this work um, couldn't have been uh, done, um, not shown here, but you'll see him in 30 seconds or so, is Chad Dickey, who was at the Mayo Clinic and uh, really led a, a, a large part of the, the, the studies. And uh, Casey Cook, uh, who is uh, here, really has been leading uh, all the HDAC-6. Uh, Obviously, I have fantastic collaborators. Uh, everyone knows Dennis, and at the time, Mike um, Hutton, who was uh, with us at, at Mayo Clinic. And as uh, Larry mentioned, um, my, my work has been supported by Cure, Cure PSP as well as, well as other uh, federal and uh, foundation support. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Just, just thinking forward about the therapeutic potential, what else does HDAC6 do? So uh, probably one of the most well-characterized uh, you know, pathways is, is uh, regulation of autophagy. Um, and so you know, that's, that's um, an area that we're going to be you know, quite interested in. And you know, maybe do similar studies that we did you know, with, with Chad is knocking down, you know, it, how is it promoting the tau degradation? Is it through autophagy, uh, presumably, maybe? Um, or is it going to be through the you know, UPS components? And so um, I don't have the answer yet, but you know, we're definitely are going to be doing those types of experiments. But that would probably be one of the major uh, pathways that HDAC6, uh, to my knowledge, through the mTOR pathway is, I, I believe, involved. In, in the human brain, the, if you look at phosphorylation versus acetylation, what, what comes first? Right. So now since we have that antibody, I mean, and we're, we're being very biased, but um, so was, you know, Lee Gann and, and uh, Virginia, because they, they were looking at very specific lysine, excuse, well, acetylated uh, tau sites, um, and they made specific antibodies. So we're developing amino assays right now to determine the ratio of 12E8 versus the acetylated sites. 
and see what happens to the progression. Um, we would speculate that there's going to be a reduction in the acetylated tau at the KXGS motifs um, with, with progression. And, and that's something that we're very, very interested in and we're um, still trying to characterize uh, the antibody. So, so, Len, I guess another way to partially try to get at that question would be just what you see with acetylation um, and also aggregation with KXGA mutants. I, maybe you showed that, but I didn't catch it. Right. So, we, so yes, yeah, so we made it for cell culture, and now we're going to do that um, with recombinant proteins, <clears throat> excuse me, to do exactly what you just did or mentioned. 